Good evening and welcome to our virtual program. My name is Brooke Clement and it is my honor to serve as Acting Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum. We will be recording tonight's event for rebroadcast on the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation and the Museum and Libraries websites. Tonight's program is also available by Zoom and Facebook. We are monitoring both of these sites for submissions from you for the question and answer portion of this program. This week, Thursday, please join us for a panel discussion titled America's New Normal. West Michigan leaders will share their perspectives on COVID-19, the 2020 election, and other seismic shifts in our economy and society in recent years. Visit FordLibraryMuseum.gov for information on panelists and registration. The panel is a joint collaboration between the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, the Ford Library and Museum, and the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies. Now I'd like to welcome Gleaves Whitney, Executive Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation to introduce tonight's speaker, Frederick Logabaugh. Thank you very much, Brooke. Well, I have the happy assignment, as you say, to introduce this evening's distinguished speaker. Frederick Logeval is no stranger to the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation Museum and Library. Many viewers may recall his enlightening presentation at the museum back in November 2017 when he spoke on the meaning of the Vietnam War. Well, here we are three years later, readying ourselves to learn once again from Professor Logeval. And this evening, he's going to share his insights into John F. Kennedy one of our most charismatic, if not enigmatic, presidents ever to make it to the White House, a president who pondered Vietnam with an almost Hamlet-like ambivalence. But Professor Logoval is not here to talk about JFK's Vietnam riddle so much as the riddle of JFK himself, especially as it revealed itself in the four decades before he reached the White House. A trained historian, Frederick Logoval, teaches at Harvard, where he is on the faculty of the History Department and the John F. Kennedy School of Government. His research, his teaching focus on US foreign relations and modern international history. His book on Vietnam called Embers of War won the 2013 Pulitzer Prize for History. His book on the 35th president called JFK Coming of Age in the American Century, 1917-1956 is a life and times treatment of a, a incredible person, a human being, when the nation is also coming of age, roughly at the same time that Kennedy is. About the book, JFK, John Meacham writes, quote, John F. Kennedy was a man before he was a monument. And among the great achievements of this wonderful book is how brilliantly Frederick Logeval conveys both JFK's humanity and the history of the age. With precision and grace, Logeval has given us a memorable portrait of a man and of the world that before he shaped it, shaped him, close quote. After Professor Logeval gives a brief synopsis of his book, my good colleague, Joel Westfall and I will engage in a moderated discussion with our guest. Joel is the deputy director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum, and to him goes the credit for spearheading this evening's terrific event. So thank you, partner, and Professor Logeval, take it away. So Fred, first of all, thank you for being here. My first question, um, again, following your uh, last book on Vietnam, Embers of War, fantastic book, which of course, as Gleaves had mentioned, won the Pulitzer Prize for history in 2013. You decided to turn to JFK and his early years. So what took you down the path to Hyannisport? Mm -hmm. Well, first off, I'm just delighted to be with you. Uh, I do have such fond memories of my, my visit uh, back in 2017. Can't believe it's been that long. I was stunned to hear that that's the the date, but uh, but here we are again. Alas, uh, not in person, but <laughs> but the next best best thing. So Joel, um, you know this was going to be a one volume biography. I'm probably not the first to uh, imagine that a, a biography of a of a in this case a president becomes somewhat longer than one thinks. And uh, you know what took me down this path was. Uh, first off an interest in Kennedy. I'd written about him in other contexts in terms of the Cold War, and as Gleave says, in terms of Vietnam. Um, so I had an understanding, I think, of him at least as president, to some extent as senator, and I was interested in him. Second, I guess uh, the source materials are fabulous. 
at the Kennedy Library and elsewhere to undertake a full life and times uh, of this president. And that's key in the sense that, and maybe we'll talk about this, in that I'm hoping in this book, in this two, it'll be two volumes, I'm hoping in this biography to tell not only the story of Kennedy's rise, uh, ultimately to the White House, but also America's rise. Because let's remember, he lives from 1917. So he's born just as the United States is entering the First World War, and he, he dies in 1963. And at the beginning of that period, 1917, the United States is a kind of um, junior member of the Great Power Club. And by the end, in 63, it's the greatest military and economic, economic power that the world has ever seen. So how does that happen? That shift, that, that shaping of modern America, both in domestic, but maybe especially um, foreign policy or foreign terms is partly what this is about. And then finally, I will just say, Joel, that the, the, the final reason why I went down this path is that though we have so many books, as you know, on aspects of Kennedy's presidency, uh, of his personal life, of his family, we actually don't have um, that many biographies. It's kind of a strange thing, actually. Um, and we certainly don't have, I believe, as much as I've leaned on what other, uh, other writers have said, I don't know that we have anybody, um, I don't believe we have anybody who's attempted to do this kind of a life and times uh, treatment. Great, thank you very much. Um, there is a predominant theme uh, throughout the entire book, uh, and that is the health of John Kennedy. Uh, I was particularly struck um, by a photograph of him in the South Pacific uh, with three others um, standing in front of a small building um, he looked completely emaciated compared to the others in the picture. Yeah. And I find it amazing that the Navy let him into the service with these issues. Um, could you go into some detail about all of his health yeah. problems going up, growing up? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're real. And, and that photograph, or if we talk about that general era when he is um, serving in the South Pacific uh, and has this, uh, I believe, heroic, uh, ultimately, experience, um, he is, as you say, razor thin. Uh, at times his weight, and this is a guy who's about six feet tall. His, his, his weight is under 140 pounds. There are times when he's really sick when it's down closer to 130. That gives you a sense of, uh, of how emaciated he was. You know, he's sickly from, from a young age. Uh, and I write about this, uh, endless ailments, uh, both uh, in you know elementary school, uh, then at Choate, his prep school, then at Harvard. He spends a lot of time in the infirmary. Some of these maladies are ill-diagnosed. I did my best to try to figure out what was actually going on, and it was hard. But um, he had various, <coughs> excuse me, various problems. He's ultimately diagnosed with Addison's disease, although not until 1947. I think he has it for several years before then. And you know, Joel, I think, I think it affects him as it would anybody in various ways. Um, but let me just single out a couple that I think matter for us. One is that I think it made him empathetic in a certain way. Maybe we could compare it a little bit to FDR's polio. Kennedy, because uh, he was sick so much, and he was given last rites twice before he was given it the third time at the time of his death in Dallas, 1963. He came, he was at death's door several times, and I write about this. I think it made him more understanding of other people. Uh, it gave him a certain empathetic understanding that I think would actually prove important when he was president. Um, so that's one conclusion that I draw from this. A second is that Notwithstanding these health problems, the energy that he pours into, especially his campaigns. So if we look at 1946, and you and I may talk about this, if we look at 52, when he runs in against Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. in the Senate race, and if we look at 1960, when he becomes president or is elected president, what's astonishing about him is that he can go and from the crack of dawn until midnight, day after day after day. And so these health problems 
uh, though they cause these problems, when he puts his mind to something, and maybe it's partly connected to the health problems that he wants to show everybody, including himself, that he can pull this off, um, uh, the energy that's there, and I think it's partly a, a family, a Kennedy energy, um, uh, not only sustains him, but I think ultimately is key to his political success. Great. Another big theme in the book is that between father and son, their divergence of views, uh, the, the, his divergence of views with Joe Sr., him being yep. an isolation, just, uh, isolationist, John Kennedy slowly moving down the path to being an internationalist. I was also very taken by your analysis that had Joe Jr. lived, mm -hmm. in all likelihood, he would not have lived up to the political aspirations his father had for yeah. him. What separated John from his father and brother here? Mm. Oh, big question. And uh, something that completely fascinated me in the research. And here again, I just want to say that the Kennedy Library is phenomenal. The Joseph Kennedy papers, that is Joe Sr. papers, um, are an absolute uh, goldmine for researchers because this is a family that uh, corresponded a lot via letters. I would say in the 1930s and through the end of World War II. So for about a 15-year period, roughly, we have excellent, excellent communication parents to children, remember there are nine of them, and then the children, especially the older ones, so that would include Jack and that would include Joe Jr. writing back or writing to each other. Um, yeah, I mean, if we take them in turn, I think that there's no question that Joe Sr. is a very important influence on Jack's life. Others have argued this. Uh, that's what I find as well. Uh, Joe Sr. was the dominant parent in many respects in the household. And by the way, that sometimes causes us to uh, diminish too much the role that Rose, the mom, played in his life, which I think is also important, and I deal with that. But Joe Sr. is a very important influence in Jack's life. But what you see, which I uh, was surprised by, if you ask me what's a surprise in the research, this was something that surprised me. The degree to which Jack, especially beginning in his junior year in college, and then senior year in college, so we're talking 1938-39, 1939-40, is willing to separate himself from his father. They disagree about isolationism, or they come to disagree, and what should be the proper U.S. response to the rising threat of the Nazis in, 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 in Europe and the Japanese in, in Asia. Um, and, and Joe Jr. is not willing to separate himself from his father. This is something that I find really interesting. So Joe Jr., who's killed in the war, as you point out, in 1944, I think goes to his death, still affirming his father's kind of fortress America, isolationist position. Jack, I think, comes to see, especially, I think, in his senior year and then in, those, in that year or so following his graduation, so now we're talking 1940, uh, 41 begins to say, uh, you know, this is an untenable position for the United States. We need to aid the British uh, in particular. Uh, we need to uh, prepare for the possibility that we ourselves will have to enter this war. And that's something he shows a willingness to do. I think it, it, um, it is a, a, an ability he has really going forward, which I think is really important. When he becomes a politician, he calls the shots, not his father, contrary to what some have suggested. It's Jack who calls the shots. Um, and I'll say one other thing here, Joel, which is that I give, I give Joe Sr. credit. Uh, Joe Kennedy, complicated man, um, was a very devoted father. Uh, and not only devoted father, but quite willing, in fact, almost insistent on his children charting their own path. He was not the parent who says, you're going to do this, and your brother will do this, and then your sister will do this. He wasn't that way. He wanted them to make their own decisions, I think, in large part. And that's, uh, that's one of his more commendable uh, qualities. Being a World War II historian myself and former archivist of the U.S. Navy, I was very interested mm. 
and your interpretation of the Kennedy P2, PT-109 era, mm. especially including in the book just how actually absolutely horrible these PT boats actually were. Yeah, yeah. What got John interested in the PT boats in the first place, and why was he really in his element on this type of craft? No, no, it's, it's, uh, it's totally interesting, isn't it? Uh, and, and you have a particular knowledge and background in all of this. I should have you... Uh, hold forth here, but uh, yeah, the boats—they're—they're they're, you know—they're thin mahogany shells. Uh, they're laden with with with, with fuel. Uh, you know, they would just explode uh, often on impact. And one of the remarkable things about this ramming. So what a, what happens in August of 1943 is that a Japanese destroyer slices PT-109, which is JFK's boat. Um, uh, and miraculously, all but two of the crew members survive, and we'll come, we can come back to this. But I think it was, I think the PT boats, uh, though they were of dubious military, <coughs> excuse me, military utility, there was something dashing about them. Uh, they had speed. Uh, they were able to maneuver quickly. When they did score a success against especially Japanese uh, ships, it was spectacular. It was front page news. Uh, and they were also really good at rescuing downed servicemen. And that too is a kind of heroic thing to be doing. So I think that appealed to him. I think he liked the fact that he would be a skipper. He would be in charge of his own boat. He was a, an expert sailor from his days in Massachusetts off uh, Hyannisport. This wasn't sailing. But it was a small vessel. He knew his way around boats. He understood how to, 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 to um, be the skipper of a boat. It turned out during his PT training that his commanders or his instructors uh, gave him very high marks. So he knew how to do this. I think, Joel, it's a combina combination of those things that led him to say, this is what I'm going to be doing. It's fascinating that some of his letters home from the Pacific before the ramming uh, indicated that, you know, these are death traps. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically said to his family members and to friends, wow, what a boat that I'm in charge of. Uh, he understood that they were in constant danger on these boats, but of course he had a duty to fulfill. And, and, um, uh, then this terrible thing happens. Um, and, you know, I'll just say here, we can pursue it further, but I'll just say that um, I don't think anybody would call JFK a, a heroic for allowing his boat to be rammed. Uh, and I deal with this in the book, but his actions afterwards, Joel, uh, in helping to save his crew, uh, really remarkable uh, efforts on his part. And his crew members were the first to say it in the aftermath, both at the time and later. They would not, they felt many of them, likely have survived without his leadership, without his efforts. Yeah, it's an absolutely incredible, uh, incredible story. And I think you lay it out really well in the book. Uh, I'm going to turn over the next couple of questions to uh, Gleaves Whitney. And while Gleaves is asking his questions, um, please feel free for those who are enjoying this lecture and book talk to ask questions of your own. Uh, please go into the Q&A uh, section and type in any questions you will have for uh, Dr. Logoval after Gleaves is done. Gleaves, over to you. Thanks, Joel. Well, Fred, given today's hyper-partisan politics, I've got to ask you about how Democrats and Republicans got along in the late 1940s and early 50s. And yeah. permit me to read a passage from your book. It comes from page 446, and then I'd like you to comment on it. Yeah. On issue after issue, Kennedy showed a marked disdain for dogmatism, whether from the left or from the right. A champion of New Deal policies, he privately worried about the expansion of government power that many of the programs necessitated. Yeah. The guest list for his salons in Georgetown typically had as many Republican as Democratic names on it. And in his speeches, he sometimes expounded on the importance in democratic politics of a spirit of compromise, of bargaining in good faith. He grew close to several conservative Democrats and often expressed admiration for Senator Robert A. Taft, the austere Republican from Ohio, whom he considered honorable and trenchant. And Kennedy also got along well 
with Richard Nixon. Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's a it's a it's a great um, question that you pose, Gleaves. I've thought a lot about this in these in these partisan times in which we live, and I do think there's a message here from young John F. Kennedy for us, which is, as you've just pointed out, that uh, democracy. And you know what's interesting about this? He said some of these things in his very first campaign, 1946, for the House of Representatives in Massachusetts skinny 29 year old, he had already figured out the following, uh, that democracy requires uh, an engaged and informed citizenry, that we should not be cynical about politics and politicians, that uh, in fact, as you point out, Democracy requires good faith bargaining between the parties. These were things that I think he believed from that first campaign right through to the end in Dallas in 1963. I think Kennedy, he reminds us Gleaves of an age when it was possible to believe, this maybe, seem, maybe seems quaint today in 2020, but I hope we can come back to this. He reminds us of an age when it was possible to leave, to believe that politics could help solve real problems, could speak to society's highest aspirations. That's powerful stuff. And I think, by the way, it's a reason for his appeal, both in office in August of 1963, so about four months before his assassination, 60% uh, of Americans claimed that they had voted for him in 1960, even though only 49.7% of Americans had voted for him. So it's not just in the aftermath of his brutal assassination that you see this outpouring of support. I think it's there while he's president. This will be part of volume two, obviously, of my book. But I think it's a powerful part of his appeal that he could do this. He was not, and I think this is a subtext of your question, he was not particularly partisan. I think his policies, both in the House and in the Senate, that is to say, the, his policy preferences, what he supported in the House and in the Senate, and then what he, what he uh, governed from as president, was democratic politics. I don't believe he was a conservative. But I also think he was, as your quote points, uh, as the quote points out, he was uh, he was wary of absolutists on both sides of the political spectrum. Uh, it was not how he tended to operate. Uh, and I think that's, yeah, I think it's an important message for us today. Very good. My, my second question, Fred, has to do with JFK's leadership. You know, we encourage students at the Cook Leadership Academy to tune into our webcasts, and they are college-age apprentice leaders. So this question is, is for the young leaders listening in. Fred, I, I note from your book that several people thought that young Jack Kennedy would someday be a great leader. For example, one of the headmasters at Choate, you know, the Episcopalian prep school the Kennedy boys attended said, and I'm gonna quote uh, on this, uh, it's on page 116. Uh, headmaster said, quote, Jack has it in him to be a great leader of men. And somehow I have a feeling that he is going to be just that, close quote. Now, after spending years thinking and researching and writing about John F. Kennedy, yeah. what do you think the X factor was that made him yeah. a great leader? What traits, if you will? Yeah. And can such a thing be learned? Yeah, I think it can. Uh, I think it can. I'll just say that isn't that a remarkable quote? This is when JFK, uh, you know, he's the son of a prominent person, that should be noted. So maybe there's a sense, oh, well, uh, you know, uh, Joseph Kennedy has become uh, fabulously wealthy and he's a, he's, a, he's a player in Washington. He's, he's an advisor to Franklin Roosevelt. Maybe that colors slightly this quote, but I really think that the headmaster believed that this young Jack Kennedy, who wasn't a particularly stellar student, by the way, uh, he didn't really apply himself. People saw, the teachers at Choate saw his potential, but um, he was a little bit of a slacker, to use the, the, the later term. Um, I think the qualities, 
some of the qualities at least um, would be these is Gleaves. Uh, I think, I think he had a historical sensibility. What do I mean? What do I mean by that? I think he believed, and this is partly going back to Joel's question about his sickly childhood, uh, because he spent a lot of time in bed. He did a lot of reading, and his preferred genre was history. Uh, he liked biography. He liked uh, 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 books on European statecraft. It developed in him a historical mind, a sensibility um, that I think is important for leaders, that I think he had, that I think I would like to encourage aspiring leaders to have. It's not so much specific historical knowledge, although he had that, but a sense of what a, 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 fami a familiarity with the past can bring, a sense of um, the unintended consequences that can follow from action, a sense that not everything is new under the sun, that we have, that there are patterns that we can see. I think young JFK had that, and I think it helps account for his leadership. I would also say he has an international sensibility. This is, <coughs> this is a theme in the book, that he, he, he looks outward, uh, and especially in an age when foreign policy becomes very important, World War II, the Cold War, when he's president, uh, I think that helps to account for his, um, that's another attribute that I would say is important here. I think what we see in his first campaign is a certain diffidence that I think proved to be really winning with voters combined with um, a kind of charismatic appeal which is an odd combination. But I would also say, Gleaves, that you see that from an early age, that voters are drawn to him uh, in part because there is a, almost a certain reticence that he brings to his campaign appearances, to his the, the smaller uh, events that would be held during his campaigns where he would meet with, with voters in smaller settings. Uh, that's a constant theme that he brings uh, to this. And then maybe the last thing I'll just mention here, since we could go on, uh, is um, a capacity for hard work. Uh, I don't think there's any, it's, it's an obvious point to make, but I think what you see with successful political candidates, maybe especially first time successful candidates, is that they're just willing to work really hard. This is a, this is a young man in all of his races, who I think works harder, starts earlier than his opponents. It's a secret, a secret of his political success. Um, but it's, as I said earlier to Joel, it's this ability to go and go and go, even when his aides are, you know, dropping like flies out of from from exhaustion. He's willing to do. He's willing to do that extra, go that extra, uh, you know, extra mile. Um, that's another uh, item I would add to the to the list. You know, and I can't help but mention, you know, since we're here in Michigan and we're impacted by the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Great oh, yeah. Lakes being all united, yeah. Fred, you do the best job, and Joel, I bet you were struck by this as well. You do the best job of showing really the prelude to Profiles and Courage when mm -hmm. John F. Kennedy goes against when he's yeah. in the Senate voting, he goes against all the Massachusetts and New England reps and senators yeah. who say, you know, a St. Lawrence Seaway will kill New England's economy. And Kennedy yeah. says, no, but it's good for the nation. And yeah. if, if the whole nation prospers, New England, the Port of Boston will be just fine. And I've, yeah. I had never considered the prelude to Profiles and Courage. So I, yeah. I applaud you for finding that well, nugget. And, and, and you make a really good point, Cleves, which, which should be higher, it should be on the list, and it should be pretty high on the list that I just gave you a few moments ago, uh, in, in terms of the secret of his leadership, or the, the, the attributes that he had in this area. It is this willingness. He didn't always show this, this, this courage. We can talk about McCarthy, we haven't discussed it yet, and his, his failure uh, in, in large part on the McCarthy issue. So I'm not, you know, this is a warts and all biography. Uh, J Jack Kennedy had his, JFK had his faults. He made his mistakes. Uh, and he was not always this profiling courage. But your point is excellent, Cleves. 
he was somebody who believed, uh, and it's, it's articulated in Profiles in Courage, which is a book, by the way, that I recommend to people, um, even though it's now, uh, you know, more than a half a century old, it still has something to teach us. This idea that politicians have to, at least some of the time, really think about what they think is in the national interest before they think about what their constituents might want, what serves them in terms of their political career, their political aspirations. There are times, and Kennedy talks quite powerfully about this in that book, uh, in which there are times when a leader has to transcend that. And you know, it goes even further back when he writes his senior thesis at Harvard on British appeasement prior to World War II. That question is central to that book. How can, what, what are the essential ingredients of leadership in a democracy? And how can leaders transcend parochial interests at critical points? It's an interest of his, I'm suggesting, from his late teenage years right to the end of his life. It's, it's really quite remarkable. Well, before, gentlemen, I know that we have a lot of questions that are queuing up. Uh, Joel, do you want to lead us through some of the questions? That we, have, we have a yes. lot of questions. We have a lot of questions and we're going to get to them, but I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask one more. Uh, and I like Fred's comment about the fact that the book is a warts and all book, which, which it really is. I mean, it really strikes you as that. And, and Fred, if you could talk about very briefly, one particular wart, which I really, really loved seeing in the book. It's a particular wart that not a lot of people really know about when it comes to the Kennedy family. And that is the story of Rosemary mm -hmm. and what happens. Yeah. Uh, it's a very humanistic and tragic, tragic story. Could you briefly go over that? Sure. Yeah, no, it, it, it really is, Joel. Uh, and, um, you know, she, she's only about, you know, a year and a half younger than JFK. So this is a, a close sibling of his. Uh, and so in that sense, they've grown up together all the way through. Um, and it becomes clear when she's a toddler and then certainly when she, be <laughs> excuse me, when she gets to be a little bit older, uh, that she is behind the others. She's not able to keep up in school. Uh, and the, the parents um, spend a lot of time and money consulting with experts uh, about what they should do. They, op they, off they, they opt for the most part for what we consider, we would consider a fairly enlightened approach, or at least would later be considered an enlightened approach, which is to mainstream her. So they have her often in the regular classroom. When that doesn't seem to be working, they have her in, uh, in, in special schools. This becomes uh, increasingly frustrating for her. Uh, and to cut a, a long and difficult story short, which I deal with at greater length in the book, and, when, and which, of course, other authors have covered uh, very ably, books focused on Rosemary, um, Joe Kennedy makes a, a horrendous decision which is in the fall of 1941. Uh, he consults with experts uh, and he uh, orders, he, he, he's, he um, has her undergo uh, um, a lobotomy. Uh, he's been assured, and I, I take his word for this, that he believed that uh, the experts were saying she will come out better. Rosemary will be able to live with the family uh, and she'll be... Um, she'll be much better as a result of this procedure. When, of course, it went terribly awry. Uh, and um, she came out much, much worse than before. And there's lots that I think we still don't understand about the decision. How involved was Rose, Rose in that decision, the mother? Um, who knew, <laughs> excuse me, who knew what afterwards? How soon did the older children find out what had happened to her sister, to their sister? Um, that's very difficult to know, even in this voluminous record that we have at the Kennedy Library. Um, and here's one final thing I'll just say about this. Um, I went through the letters 
uh, Rose Kennedy wrote uh, round robin letters to to the to the children in World War II. So letters that were really summarizing for the kids and to some extent for for Joe the goings on, because everybody's scattered. Uh, the, the the older boys are at war. Um, the others are in various places. So she wrote these letters, and I could not find a mention, a mention of Rosemary in any of her letters in 42, 43, 44, uh, 45. It's a remarkable thing that her mother doesn't refer to her after this terrible procedure in the fall of 1941, which was right before Pearl Harbor. So there's a lot going on here. Uh, and then this on, on top of it. Yeah, that's a really, it's a really tragic story. Gleaves, why don't you handle the first question from, the, uh, from our patrons? Okay, very good. This first question comes from our good colleague, historian over to Aquinas College, Jason Duncan. Jason writes, uh, Professor Duncan writes, Fred, other than the need to work hard and to have a well-financed campaign, what other lessons about politics and people did JFK learn from his 1946 campaign for a House seat? Uh, well, first off, it's, it's good to hear from, from, from Jason. Uh, and it's, a, it's an excellent question. I think he learned, as I said earlier, I think he learned, uh, and, 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 and he was skeptical, by the way, at the outset, that they needed to start quite as, quite as early as they were starting with this campaign. But I think he learned that that was an advantage. I think he learned that he needed to become a better speaker. I think he was determined. Uh, he was not very good to begin with. When the topic was foreign policy, he was pretty comfortable. But as soon as he strayed into to local politics, which of course was what mattered most to the voters in the 11th district in Massachusetts, uh, or, or state politics, domestic politics in general, he turned wooden, he spoke too fast. Uh, he also learned that he needed to become a better extemporizer. He needed to be able to ad lib. The best politicians, Jack Kennedy came to realize, they have an ability to just to have sort of repartee and to, to speak to voters in a way that they can understand without having their head buried in a script. That was something I think he took away from that 1946 campaign. I think he also knew, maybe everybody knew, that you know, dad's money, dad's money was important here. Other candidates, and what mattered, I should stress to people, I should I should mention that what mattered, of course, is the Democratic primary. It's the nomination. Once you get the nomination in the spring of 1946, you're guaranteed to, to win in the fall. So the, the race that really matters in the in the spring is the one in the spring for the Democratic nomination. I think Kennedy could see that the other candidates. And there were, I think, 10 people on the ballot, um, uh, ultimately. They all had day jobs. They all had to you know, work regular full-time jobs. And then whatever time was left over is they, they spent on campaigning. Jack Kennedy didn't have to worry about that. So he had that advantage. And I think that's something he took from that 1946 campaign. And then I'll just say finally, and maybe I said this earlier, but I think he learned that um, there was no substitute for contact with voters. So they staged a lot of events, uh, small events often, sometimes mid-sized events, and he would go and go and go with these events. Often the family would be involved. This is a family operation. That's maybe something else that, they, that he learns. And I guess the last thing I'll just say here is that he understood, he came to see that he had a particular appeal to female voters. Uh, you could see already in that first campaign that um, he connected with uh, female voters who were going to be important in this campaign, and they were going to be of increased importance uh, later in his career, and that was something he could capitalize on as well. Next question. Um, this one comes from uh, Nikki Kearney. Uh, and the question is, uh, what role did faith play for JFK in his formative years? Mm. That's a really uh, good question, uh, Nikki. Um, you know, he was a committed Catholic his whole life. I was kind of struck by and when I learned from uh, when, when his widow said, not long after he died, when Jackie said that even in the White House, 
Jack got on his knees um, to pray. So he was, I think, a, Catholic, a committed uh, Catholic uh, throughout his life. He was not particularly devout uh, compared to some of his family members, compared especially to his mother. And I think this caused her anguish uh, that, that Jack was not as, um, as devout as she wanted him to be. Or, frankly, as committed as, 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 as Robert, Bobby was, Eunice. Um, and I write about the fact that he experienced moments of real doubt. Uh, people of faith, um, I mean, I think faith and doubt go hand in hand. So this is not anything that's unusual. But there were moments, and he, and he talked about this, and I write about it, when he really wondered uh, about his faith. I think in the aftermath of Rosemary's lobotomy, that was such a moment. Um, he was in love with a woman, a Danish woman named Inga Arvad, and that relationship, he was, I think, very much in love with her. That broke up in part because, you know, he was Catholic and she was Protestant. That, I think, caused them to wonder, well, what's this all about? Um, and some of it, I think, was just the kind of questions that a mature person asks. You know, you've been, as a child, you've grown up in a church. Uh, and you take maybe for granted the, 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 the teachings of that church. And then as, as you become an adult, you, uh, you often keep that faith, but you, you raise questions. You have questions about it. I think he was, he was not unusual in that regard, but he certainly had them. Um, and then maybe the last thing to be said about this is that the faith, of course, affects how he thinks about his political prospects, because he knows Everybody knows that there are limits, or there appear to be limits, to how high in American politics a Catholic can reach. And when he begins to think seriously about the presidency, or toward the end of my first volume, when he really wants to be vice president with Adlai Stevenson in 1956, the Catholic issue is huge. Can he uh, overcome that barrier, if you want to call it a barrier. Um, and if so, what does it mean for the ticket? That's a very large question in 1956. Uh, and it'll be a large question in 1960. Um, so in that sense, too, the, the, the faith, the Catholicism, is it's part of who he is and part of how we should think of him. And of course, you know, our president-elect uh, is going to be the second Catholic president. So there's that connection between uh, JFK and Joe Biden. Well, here's a question uh, from a viewer. And of course, since we're in West Michigan, Fred, we've got to ask the Gerald Ford question. You know, they served in <coughs> Congress at the same time. And uh, of course, after JFK was assassinated, Ford served on the Warren Commission. He was the oldest surviving member of the Warren Commission. Yeah. And uh, this viewer wants to know, during their years together in Congress, you know, how well did they know each other? How well did they get along working together, even though they had to cross party lines to do so? That kind of thing. Good well, question. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's a question that is only going get, to get a preliminary answer, because as I delve into the research for volume two, that's one of the questions that I really want to try to get a better handle on. Like every other historian, uh, I'm just so anxious for the archives to reopen. Uh, and I'm in a holding pattern on with respect to at least that part of my research for volume two uh, until that happens. The JFK library, which is so important to me, has been closed for obvious reasons since March. But I think that one is one that I want to know much more about. My preliminary answer uh, is that it was a it was a uh, mutually respectful relationship. I have some materials already indicating that that's the case. Um, I don't have the sense yet that they were particularly um, close. Uh, I think we talked a little bit earlier about the fact that Richard Nixon and, and Jack Kennedy, um, though they would later, uh, shall we say, grow apart uh, in 47 in particular, when they were first in Washington, we're actually pretty good friends, uh, and I write about that. The Ford relationship, uh, I think, is a good one, uh, as far as I can tell, um, but I'll have more to say uh, before too long. 
The next question um, is from uh, Paolo Graziani. Uh, he writes, uh, Professor Logoval, greetings from Italy. I studied JFK for many years and I am still working on him. Uh, for many, he still represents the prototype of the progressive politician. Mm. Uh, should, would, should you or do you define him as a real liberal or more of a pragmatic and a realist, especially in his foreign policy? Mm. Well, especially if we're talking um, about foreign policy, certainly I would not call him a liberal, although I'll, I'll qualify that in a moment. Uh, as I said earlier, I don't think of John F. Kennedy as a conservative. There's been an argu argument, there's even a book uh, with that title, JFK Conservative, that I don't find ultimately persuasive, although it's a thoughtful book. Uh, on fiscal policy and on foreign policy, you could make a pretty good argument that he was conservative. Early in the Cold War, for example, and I write about this, he was a kind of original Cold Warrior. Unlike his father, here again, they're separated, in fact, the gap between them grows, uh, I would say, in the early Cold War, where Joe Kennedy thinks this is stupid. Uh, the Soviets are not going to invade anybody. Uh, we don't need to go to these measures to, to try to check Soviet expansionism. Whereas JFK, as a member of, 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 of the House, and then I think as a senator, is very much a staunch Cold Warrior. I would qualify it, though, by saying that from an early point, John F. Kennedy has a sense that it's not just about communism versus anti-communism, that the world is a complicated place, that especially the developing world, the newly independent nations are going to chart their own path. We need, partly for Cold War related reasons, we need to respond to the aspirations of those nations. And we can't simply put it in terms of, you know, you're with us or you're against us, you're either communist or you're not. It's one of the reasons why I believe, for example, on Vietnam, on Indochina, he is an early skeptic. Even in 1951, when he goes on his first visit to Vietnam, I think he sees through the French expressions of bravado. He sees through the French promises of ultimate success. And he basically says, this is JFK, he says, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm not sure any Western power can succeed by military means in that part of the world. Um, and I think that, by the way, is a skepticism that never goes away. And that adds to the kind of paradox that we see with Kennedy's Vietnam policy. This same skeptic, this fellow with these misgivings, nevertheless oversees a, a pretty significant expansion of US involvement in Vietnam uh, during his presidency. How do we explain this? Well, that's one of the things I have to do in, in volume two of this work. But I would say that this is all leading to a, 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 a summation that I think he's fun, fundamentally a pragmatic, quite centrist politician. Uh, on most policy issues, certainly on the domestic side, I think he's kind of in the center of his democratic party. But, a, but democratic. And on foreign policy, uh, I would say he's relatively hawkish, but with a skepticism emerging partly from his experience in World War II. So I write about this in, in this book, a skepticism about the utility of military force to solve political problems, which I think, again, he carries through, and which is not particularly hawkish. You could argue it's the opposite of hawkish. Uh, and of course, in his inaugural address, which I think is misinterpreted as a very hawkish document, I don't think it actually, or speech, I don't think it actually is. And in some of his other speeches as president, you see a much more nuanced, uh, much more skeptical John F. Kennedy. Um, and I'm among those who believes that the Cold War in his final year, he and Khrushchev were at least partly on the way to, if not ending, at least ameliorating to a very substantial degree. So that's a, it's a great question. And I hope that at least the beginnings of an answer. And good luck with the work over there in Italy, by the way. Keep it up. <laughs> Is it, am I up next, Joel? You are, you are, Louise, go ahead. Okay, here's a question from Brenda Baker. She wants to know, she's curious about you as a researcher, Fred. 
what's the question that you wish you could have answered that you were not able to answer about John F. Kennedy's early life? Hmm. That's really good. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there are obvious questions about that with respect to the, to the end of his life. Um, so-called counterfactual questions. And I'm, by the way, a big believer in counterfactuals in asking what if questions. And of course, Vietnam, which we've been discussing is, is, is one of those. What I, w- I wish I could have asked him toward the end of his life, what are your plans for Vietnam, Mr. President? Or civil rights, what do you really want to accomplish with civil rights? Do you want a very comprehensive civil rights bill? Those are questions that I wish I could have found out and which I could have talked to him about. I think with respect to his early life, I still find Jack Kennedy's relationship with his mother hard to hard to fully figure out. I wish I had, I don't know, I don't know what form it would have taken. I don't know if it would have been more candid letters between the two of them. Um, presumably that's, that's what I'm talking about or some other evidence for what the relationship was. Uh, I think they clearly loved each other. Uh, and she had a certain emotional reserve uh, her her husband, which was much the warmer of the two when it came to relating with the kids. And I think, as I said earlier, sh- she struggled with the fact that Jack had this independent streak, that he was more questioning with respect to uh, church life uh, and, um, you know, what she wanted to see in terms of his, uh, of his beliefs. But that's one that I think uh, I still wish I could have learned uh, more uh, about. There are other things that I wish I could have known more about. I wish we had, uh, the evidence is pretty good with respect to PT-109, but there are holes there, you know, in, in sort of cinematic terms that I wish I could, that I wish I could fill or plug, whatever the, whatever the expression would be. But maybe if I had to single out one, uh, though I, I, I try to describe, I hope with success, at least some success, the relationship with his mom because mothers, mothers and sons, mothers and children, it's such an important relationship for all of us. I just wish I could have done more. Well, you just mentioned PT-109. This next question comes from Brian. Um, just looking for a little bit more detail on the yeah. PT-109 exploits of John F. Kennedy. Uh, and he simply asks, how did he and his, uh, those other nine survivors escape after being rammed by the Japanese destroyer? Well, Brian, it's a good question. Uh, you know, as, as, the, as, as the dawn comes, this is a middle of the night ramming uh, and they're clinging to the remnant of the PT-109. As dawn comes and as the morning begins, they have a decision to make, which means he's got a decision to make because he's the skipper. Uh, this, this thing is gonna sink before too long. It's taking on more and more water. <coughs> we have to decide what to do. And he asks them, what should we do, guys? And they say, well, you're the boss. You decide. And he makes the decision then, um, an extraordinary one, um, which is that they're going to make, they're going to swim to a small island that he can make off in the distance. Uh, There's several islands. Many of them are uh, Japanese held, and he knows that. So he chooses a small one, thinking, well, it's less likely that that one will have um, Japanese uh, troops. And they begin this, I got to call it an epic swim in which he tows McMahon in, in, in basically in his teeth. Um, so he's pulling, a stra- he's got a strap to McMahon, pulling, that, pulling McMahon in his teeth while he swims. And he had, he had, he had been a competitive swimmer, swimmer for Harvard. He was an excellent swimmer. But nevertheless, this is about a four hour swim shark infested waters, the possibility of the Japanese coming upon them at any time, whether it's aircraft or a vessel. And these guys have to swim uh, for about four hours, which they do. And he's got the biggest job of all. And they make it to this tiny island, which has come to be called Kennedy Island. And um, his hunch proves to be correct, which is that it's uninhabited it's barely bigger than a football field, maybe a couple of them. 
um, it doesn't work for them over the over um, for more than a day or so because there's really no food to be had. Um, but a critical early decision of his that, of course, proves to be um, uh, ultimately brilliant and helps to save helps to save their lives. We've got a question from Richard Marsh. Uh, you know, uh, going staying with the theme in World War II, yeah. when uh, Jack Kennedy was in the UK, he got the chance to uh, observe Winston Churchill a little bit yeah. uh, more up close and personal than had he been on this side of the water. Yeah. Uh, what did he think of Churchill and how much did Churchill influence, say, his leadership style? Oh, I love it. I love it. The, the relationship with Churchill is, 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 well, maybe relationship with is not the right way. His, it's a sort of one way relationship, although of course they would meet. Uh, um, but I think he is deeply interested in Churchill. When he is 12 or 13 years old, and this gives you a sense of his precocious nature, because not every 12 or 13 year old would want to read a multi-volume history of World War I. But Churchill, in, uh, you know, who was, of course, a prolific historian, to say the least, wrote this thing, The World Crisis. And um, young Jack Kennedy read it. And I think it's the beginning of a lifelong fascination with Churchill. I think when he is in Europe, and in England in particular, he begins to, to pay attention to Churchill, begins to read his speeches, uh, when he becomes a political candidate, he uh, uh, listens to Kurt Churchill's speeches, he reads them, he tries to emulate them. The idea that Churchill is both uh, a politician and a scholar of sorts, a writer and an orator, I think that totally appeals to, to young Jack Kennedy. And he wants to be, be kind of like Churchill, even if there's only one Churchill. I think it's a really fascinating relationship that I think means a lot to him. And I'll say one other thing. <clears throat> Apropos this difference between Joe Kennedy and his son. Joe Kennedy could never understand the appeal of Winston Churchill. He thought, he thought he was a, a guy who drank too much. He thought he was a guy who could not really be depended upon, that he was unscrupulous. Um, didn't see it when he was ambassador. We haven't noted yet that Joe Kennedy was ambassador, US ambassador to Britain, 1938 to 40. It's a critical period in all of this. And Jack is able to see this up close. Jack, on the other hand, on the other hand could see the appeal of Winston Churchill. Um, he had a sense of the, of, of the romantic in Churchill. Could see that politics is in part about inspiring people. Uh, that's something that Joe Kennedy could never understand, even though he had his own presidential aspirations. He was the first Kennedy who wanted to be president. Uh, it, of course, didn't happen. But that's something he couldn't see. Jack Kennedy could see it. And I think he took valuable lessons from that when he himself, uh, of course, ran then for politics, ultimately ran for the presidency. Um, and uh, his decision to try to publish and to publish his senior thesis is in part inspired again by the example of Winston Churchill publishing a book. That's something that I want to do. I won't write as many as Churchill, but by golly, I'm going to do something. So I think a, a really in interesting relationship. <clears throat> I think you point out really well in the book, the disdain that he has with Winston Churchill. And as opposed to that, I think you point out really well in the book of his affinity with, Nelson, uh, with uh, Neville Chamberlain. I oh, thought that yeah. was just great. It was great. Uh, this question comes from John, and it's uh, again on this leadership on the leadership question that Gleaves had asked earlier. Uh, and the question from John Kearns is: As someone who served in World War II, uh, what was John Kennedy's view of Eisenhower's leadership during the mm -hmm. war, and how did that impact their relation when he was in Congress? Well, John, it's 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 certainly the case that he. Uh, had great admiration for um, Eisenhower uh, as general, as the su Supreme Allied Commander. Uh, and when they, uh, I'm not sure they actually met face to face. This is another thing I would have loved to, to find the, the full answer to. But they were in Potsdam together uh, in uh, the summer of 1945, shortly after the German surrender, but before the Japanese 
uh, war, the Japanese surrender. They're there at the time of the of the Potsdam Conference, and Kennedy kept a diary. This is one of the one. This is one of the great um, sources that we have. Those of us who study JFK is that on some of his travels, including here in the summer of 1945, he kept a diary that has been preserved for posterity. And you see in that diary, and we also have other evidence from that extraordinary summer, uh, his deep admiration for Eisenhower, that there was something kind of magical about the way Eisenhower carried himself. He writes about this in the diary, that he's somebody whose leadership is just, you know, it's, it exudes, it, it, you know, it pours forth from every, every pore in Eisenhower. That's something that I think Kennedy perceives. Um, as senator, you know, he's elected at the same time that when, when Eisenhower enters the, the, the presidency, Jack Kennedy uh, enters the Senate. And it's, by the way, interesting that in Massachusetts, in the fall of 1952, I, Eisenhower wins Massachusetts handily by a couple of hundred thousand votes. He crushes Adlai Stevenson in Massachusetts. And yet, JFK is able to buck that Republican trend to withstand that, that wave, if you will, and win this monster uh, victory against Henry Cabot Lodge. So they come in at the same time. Um, I think he admires, respects still Eisenhower enormously. As the years pass, as we get into 56, uh, and he's a candidate, potential candidate for vice president, then of course he's critical of Eisenhower. And I think, I think the bloom is off the rose. Uh, it's not just for partisan reasons, but for other reasons. I think he finds Eisenhower's leadership to be lacking, both in domestic politics and in foreign policy. And of course, in 1960, which I'll write about in the volume to come, uh, he's harshly critical of the Eisenhower administration, especially in foreign policy, uh, in part because Richard Nixon, his, his likely opponent, is the vice president. So that's partly for political reasons, but also I think genuine intellectual ones. So I guess I'm suggesting there's a, there's, a, there's a certain trajectory to JFK's views of Eisenhower, though that fundamental respect for him as a military leader, I don't think that ever goes away. Let me add one other quick thing, which is one of the remarkable resources we have as historians are the White House tapes. And of course the tapes for the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 1962, unbelievable. You can be a fly on the wall and I play these tapes for my students, a selection of them for that reason. Those of you who are educators, I strongly encourage you to play some of these tapes of the missile crisis. One of them, and I just wanna mention briefly is Eisenhower and Kennedy. So this is now the president and his immediate predecessor talking on the 22nd of October about what should happen. And what's striking about that conversation is that it's Eisenhower who is the hawk. Eisenhower who basically is counseling a military solution to the installation of Soviet missiles in Cuba. And I sometimes I say to my students, what if we had followed that course? What do you think would have happened? I think we can be grateful for the fact that John F. Kennedy insisted in those meetings with his advisors that he was going to do everything he could to find a political solution to the Cuban Missile Crisis. So that's those are the sort of bookends in some ways of the uh, Eisenhower-Kennedy relationship. That's fascinating. We have a question about uh, Kennedy and his relationship with Lyndon Johnson in the 40s and 50s. Uh, we've yeah. talked a little bit, Fred, you've, I think, described very well in your book and here this evening, the uh, actually the comity between Democrats and Republicans, often in the late 40s and the 50s. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the most rancorous divisions were within a party. Yeah. And certainly yeah. the Democratic Party had its divisions at this time. Talk yeah. a little bit, if you would, about that sense of division and, and specifically yeah. JFK and LBJ. Yeah. No, I think it's a really good point, Cleves, that in fact, the, 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 the discord uh, within the parties could be great or as great or greater. The Republicans were deeply split, uh, and I write about this. You have an internationalist wing, if you will, 
uh, and one that is more um, isolationist. I think that term still applies. And there are divisions within the Democratic Party. There are also personal divisions. Um, I think that may be, <laughs> in some ways, the more important one in this relationship between JFK and LBJ. Um, I think that Lyndon Johnson has a hard time taking Jack Kennedy seriously, partly because of his age. He thinks he's a young whippersnapper. He's wet behind the ears. Um, he does not have the kind of credentials, the kinds of experience that somebody who should be our vice presidential nominee, this is 56, should have. Um, and of course, their, 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 their rivalry is much greater in 1960, which I'll write about. In fact, I'm really looking forward to delving into that relationship. Uh, others have written about that sort of um, tension in that relationship. Um, and what's ironic, of course, is that ultimately he will choose Lyndon Johnson to be his running mate, uh, Kennedy Will, um, which is a story unto itself. And arguably, this is a rare instance in American history in which the vice presidential candidate makes a difference. That that choice, arguably, we can never really know, but helps deliver a very narrow victory for JFK in that presidential election. So the relationship, and then of course there's uh, LBJ as vice president, often feeling ignored, often being ignored, justifiably frustrated by his relationship with Kennedy, uh, the president, uh, which is also something that I'm going to explore. But I would say in this early period, when they're in Congress together, uh, a certain mutual skepticism, very different people, very different personalities, um, um, that shapes how they see um, one another. So we will do one more question. And I am very thankful for Michael Lazasso, who just recently asked this question. Uh, it's something that has not been covered yet. Uh, and Michael's question is, what was Kennedy's opinion of Joseph McCarthy and the second Red mm. Scare? Well, thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting part of this story that, you know, on the one hand, JFK comes of age politically during the early Cold War. That's when we see his rise. His first entry into Capitol Hill to Congress is in January of 1947. 1947, I think, is the year that many historians would say the Cold War begins. So he's very much connected to the Cold War. And there is this domestic component to it. Um, and in the form of a kind of um, anti-communist campaign in the United States, that's in some respects mirrors what's going on abroad, I guess we could say. And McCarthy is part of that. Um, they are, here's the part that's interesting about this. And I don't think I knew this, at least not fully until I began my research. The, uh, McCarthy is close to the Kennedys. He's especially close with Joe Sr. and with Robert, with Bobby, who works for McCarthy and remains devoted to McCarthy right to the end. In fact, Bobby Kennedy secretly, or at least quietly, flew to, to Wisconsin for, for McCarthy's funeral. And so he remained very attached to Joe McCarthy to the end. JFK was not. Um, they got along fine, but I, I think that um, the kind of senatorial good manners, uh, the kind of respect for procedure uh, the graciousness that JFK, uh, with which JFK carried himself, I think was obviously not Joe McCarthy. He was a bull in a china shop. He was a very different kind of person. And I don't think, I don't think they meshed in that regard. But I mention it because one reason why, as I said earlier tonight, JFK was not a profile in courage on McCarthy was because of that family connection. His father was, was very fond of McCarthy. I think that helped to convince JFK that he should keep his powder dry, not endorse what McCarthy was up to in terms of the red baiting and the so on and so on, but uh, not say very much. The second factor here is that there were an awful lot of Catholics in Massachusetts, Irish Catholics in Massachusetts, who loved Joe McCarthy. And Kennedy, as an aspiring politician, said, 
you know what, maybe I don't need to pick this, I need to pick my battles. Maybe this is one that I should not engage. And I think for those two reasons <clears throat> in particular, he was reluctant to take McCarthy on. This caused all kinds of headaches for him later on with liberals in the Democratic Party. Eleanor Roosevelt, Mrs. Roosevelt basically took a long time to warm to, to JFK because she said, you were qu <clears throat> quiet on McCarthy. Why were you so quiet? Others too, in the, on the left side of the Democratic Party um, really struggled with this. And even when McCarthy was censured in the Senate and JFK, who was recovering in the hospital from very serious surgery that almost killed him, he could have told his aide, Ted Sorensen, he could have registered his vote on censure with Sorensen, indicated what his vote would have been even now late 1954, JFK chose not to do so. So it's a, it's a complicated part of, 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 of the story. I think a really interesting one. Um, it's not one where I think he comes out particularly well because it goes against some of those precepts that he articulates so well, especially in his book, Profiles and Courage. Well, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Logoval for uh, doing this wonderful book talk tonight. Uh, it will be available uh, on our YouTube channel uh, shortly. Um, I would also like to give out a little plug. Um, if you were not around um, back in 2017 for Dr. Logoval's absolutely brilliant lecture on the Vietnam, early facets of the Vietnam War, that is available on our YouTube channel uh, for your viewing pleasure. And I, I highly, highly recommend listening to uh, that lecture. Um, I also cannot wait uh, to see you in person in whenever you're done with part, volume part two. Um, and we can all get together and have you again uh, back at the, um, uh, at the Ford Museum in Grand Rapids. Gleaves, you finish it out. Close it out for us. Well, I tell you, this is a wonderful book to read. Just, just as uh, the book on Vietnam, I second what Joel said. Go back and look at the November 19, uh, 2017 uh, talk at the Ford on the Vietnam War. You're going to see Vietnam in a totally different way. And I urge you to get this book and read it. It, it takes you, the past is a foreign country. This book takes you into the past <laughs> in a way that'll help you see some other possibilities in politics. And uh, it'll make a good Christmas present too. Well, so I wanna thank you uh, <clears throat> both just uh, for a tremendous evening, Joel, for being inspired to invite Fred Logoval back. Fred, you hit a home run, hit it out of the park. Thank you so much for your expertise. And I, we invite you to uh, tune in on Thursday for America's New Normal at 7 p.m. Big thanks to you both. I, I, it's been a wonderful evening. I thank you and, and thanks again for having me, uh, even if it's uh, virtual this time. Next time, Joel, definitely in person. Next in person and then afterwards, Knickerbocker. Deal. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. thank you very much. And thank you very much for the great patronage tonight. Uh, great crowd. Uh, lots of folks. Super questions. Um, hopefully we'll see you all in person down the road. And again, please stay tuned for all of our upcoming virtual programs. Good night.